Hello and welcome to the Astranti Top 10 Most Likely Unseen Issues for the August Operational Case Study Exam on Wise Choice Hotels. So before we start, I'm just going to go through a bit of an introduction to this particular video and where I've got the information on and what you need to do with said information. So how have I come up with these top 10? Well, first of all, you look at the focus in the precinct. If there's a lot of material in the precinct on a certain topic, then it's likely that there is some kind of importance of that topic. It's likely to be brought up in the exam, so there's more to talk about. And that feeds into the second point here, the de degree of importance attached to it by the examiner. But that particular section extends beyond purely what's in the pre-scene, but also what SEMA like to examine. For example, ethics. It may be that there's no real mention of ethics in the case study, but ethics is considered very important by SEMA, and therefore they are likely to examine it. Next is the strategic importance. How important is it to the organization? If a certain topic is very important to the company, for example, say uh, their suppliers. If they rely very heavily on a certain supplier, then it's likely that there might be an issue on the supplier. If something were to happen to that supplier, what impact could that have on the business? And also, just a more general experience in doing these videos in creating mock exams and reviewing exams in the past, the typical kind of issues that come up and what kind of things have the examiner brought up in the past. And my final point here is about how easy it is to write issues on that subject. The people who write the exams are obviously people too, and they will go for ones that they know, go for ones that they know that they can write good questions on. So what do you need to do for these issues? Well, first of all, it's important to prepare key models. So this will be things like your SWOT exam, like your SWOT analysis, like your PESEL analysis. Because building up this information now will help you to adapt the new information given you in the unseen or help you to have that, that context to apply the unseen material. Next thing you need to do is practice exam questions on these issues. And this will help you to understand the kind of questions that will be asked around these topics and how to answer them. And also, this next section here, it will help you to plan these answers in your mind so that when you go into the exam and you start writing, you will already have uh, a background to in which to apply this new information. You'll already have certain points to bring up in your head as you're writing for them. And I've also put some more generic things here, such as the advantages and disadvantages of these certain topics, uh, where they would be used and how models can be used to support them. So let's move on to the top 10 issues now. Now we're gonna kick off our top 10 issues by looking at issue 10 on funding. Now the reason why I've chosen funding here to be a key issue is because it ties with many different things, such as equity funding, debt funding, and dividend policy, as well as the cost of capital, which of course is relevant for investments. Our investments will appear later on in my top 10 issues, but they are often tied with questions on funding. And so therefore, I believe that funding will also appear. And other reasons for this include the fact that it is generally examined, very commonly examined, and as I've said, it can be used as part of other questions. So it may not appear as its own question, but it often appears in some form as part of another question or something that should at least be mentioned when answering a question on something else. So what kind of issues may arise when it comes to funding? Well, the purchase of new properties, the acquisition of another company. We know that Wise Choice Hotels business model is to buy existing hotels as going concerns. So of course they will need money for this, they will need funding for this. They may also want to introduce a new 
information strategy or information technology project. I spoke about the processing and booking system and credit system in the pre-scene and how it was somewhat outdated and could be improved and therefore a project or something that requires funding for maybe a new information technology project something that ties all the different hotels systems together so they don't have three different ways of booking that all has to be rectified together something that does it all as it is working so if someone books a room it will immediately be booked on the system and it will flag up as booked regardless of what anyone else is doing for example in the pre-scene it spoke about how corporate customers often book over emails and then they book the rooms and then a few days later or as soon as possible uh, the people in the office book in certain rooms as requested but what if those rooms have already been taken what if someone is booking those rooms online at the very same time they wouldn't know about it and of course it would help them allocate the rooms based on the length of time that people stay now we know that the average business customer stays for two nights the average visitor stays for three nights and the average holiday maker stays from between seven and fourteen nights so what if we have one or two day gaps in between we can we can't allocate the room to anyone or we could only allocate it to a business customer what if we have a six day gap then we can allocate that to a couple of visitors or three business customers but no hotel uh, holiday makers we may be also asked a question on funding methods so debt versus equity questions about our short-term working capital and our working capital ratios such as inventory days receivable days and payable days dividend policies so wise choice hotels is owned by private owners so are they taking enough money out of the business or taking too much money out of the business or are they putting it back in for investments in the last year they actually took all of the profit they made and reinvested it in the company so it does show that the owners are keen to reinvest in the organization and what points must be raised if we are asked a question on finance and financing in the exam well for starters the level of cash was incredibly high. They had over four million M dollars in cash and cash equivalents, which is a huge amount. In fact, it's arguably too much considering that the increase in assets showed that purchasing a hotel was only a few million M dollars. So they have enough here, arguably for another hotel, which of course is crucial to their business model, crucial to their expansion. However, we must never assume that all cash is available for investment. Some may be committed elsewhere. They may have a financial strategy to have a certain amount of bumper cash. They also have no debt financing. Nowhere in the pre scene did it mention anything about the fact that they'd taken out any loans and there was no loans in their non-current liabilities. So they have room to take on additional debt funding because they currently do not have any. They also have a very high level of assets. Now, obviously, we cannot raise money against intangible assets, but they have a huge amount, over $5 million M dollars in non-current assets. Now, these could be either be sold to raise funds. It's unlikely because that would involve selling hotels, but they could be used as security to raise debts. They have millions of M dollars worth of assets to raise financing against. And here's the suggested order of raising funds. So if we are presented with a project and we're told how much it's going to cost, we then go through this order saying which is the most suitable for raising funds. Now, the first one would be to use cash available. As we know, they have a lot of cash available. So if they do not need a certain proportion of that money for something else and it can be paid for out of that cash, then they should do that. The next one is debt funding. Now, debt funding can be used by getting a bank loan or by securing current or non-current large assets against the, the loan, the security. 
So if we cannot pay for it outright, we need to take out a loan. Now, if we cannot take out a loan for enough, the next one would be to sell existing assets. Obviously, that may not be consistent with the company's strategy because, of course, their strategy is all about buying hotels. And selling one hotel to buy another would not make much sense. And the final way of raising finance, if none of those work, if those all fail, is to make money through equity. Now, as it's a private company, they could raise money by floating on the stock market. Of course, you can raise a huge amount of funds this way. However, it's quite expensive to do and often not worthwhile doing unless you are a truly huge company. Now, they are a, quite a big company, but they're not a huge international business. And also, the owners would not want to lose control. Currently, it's owned by Molly and John, the two owners of the business, two founders of the business, and they would not want to give up control of the company to shareholders, particularly given that they are so influential and important to the business. And theory you can use here relates to the differences between debt and equity. Now, obviously, debt is a lot more quick, is a lot quicker. You can just go to the bank, secure your assets, get the money you know, in the space of a few days or a week. And generally, it's cheaper because it costs a fortune to raise money on the stock market. However, equity does have its advantages. Now, in equity, you do not have to pay back pay back your investors in the form of dividends which of course is different to interest payments and repayments on loans that you take from the bank if you do not pay them back when you're supposed to you may be fined you may have to pay more back overall or you may even lose the asset that you secured the funding against so there's a lot of disadvantages for each of them however given the current circumstances of the business i would always suggest that they use debt financing because the owners simply don't want to give up control and you wouldn't want them to anyway because they are, they are so important to the business they drive a lot of the business as i mentioned earlier they reinvested all the profit in the company this year and so that shows that they're really keen to take the business forward they're not looking to use it as a cash machine for their own lives now, my next issue, issue nine, is on an issue with staff or management. Now, the main reasons why I've chosen this is because it's been a common issue in the past. There's no information on unions, which is odd because it is a labor intensive organization. There's not any real machines being used. The workforce is comprised of people. And therefore, staff are incredibly important to the organization as is the management, the directors obviously being the owners and the founders. So what kind of issues could come up? Well, there could be an issue with health and safety. For example, unsafe conditions for fixing and maintaining some of the things in the hotel, such as the boilers and the lighting systems, the union asking for a pay, if there was a union of hotel staff asking for a pay rise, of course, slightly unlikely because we pay far better, or white hotels pay far better than the minimum wage, and that again is different from the rest of the industry. Or it could be something to do with redundancy. Uh, for example, cutting down the amount of employees, cutting down that 30 guaranteed hours, or perhaps bringing in their own staff following an acquisition. Now, so far, the company has kept on the employees, but what if they'd got the employee training system to such a stage that they wanted to bring in their own staff after an acquisition. Now, as they purchase the hotels as going concerns, the staff of those hotels become staff of Wise Choice Hotels. And therefore, you have to be careful how you deal with them. You cannot just let them all go because they are technically now your employees. So we have to be careful with that. Now, what kind of issues could come with regard to management. So maybe a key staff member leaving. If one of the founders or one of the directors said that 
they want to pursue other interests, they were going to leave the organisation, what impact would that have? A lot of drive, a lot of innovation comes from the, the key management staff, the directors of the organisation. If John had decided that he was going to leave, how are we going to replace him as the managing director? Do we promote another director to management director? Do they have the relevant skills for that? Do we bring in from outside a managing director who has experience in the hotel industry? And what happens in the meantime, in between the two? Where does that leave the rest of the organisation? And again, key management staff, for example, the hotel managers or the deputy managers threatening to leave, asking for more pay. How important are they to the hotels? Can we just replace the managers of the hotels or are they looked up to by the staff and therefore we cannot just get rid of them, we have to treat them well? And also the quality of staff themselves, the quality of the training. As the hotel is, uh, company is growing quite quickly, it's gone from one hotel or no hotels to four hotels in the space of 10 years. Can the training of staff, the induction of staff, keep up with the rate in which the hotel the company is growing? So let's look at strikes first of all. Obviously there was no mention of unions, but if they are in union or if they decide to unionize a threat to the company, of a union is striking. Now what kind of reasons could there be to avoid a strike? What kind of things should we be making sure don't happen if we go on strike or reasons to not go on strike? Obviously lost revenues. The company is a service company. It's based on people treating people. If we have no employees then there's no one to treat the customers at the hotel. In a sense Employees are so useful or so important to a hotel that a hotel simply will not be able to open its doors if it doesn't have adequate personnel. And it can also affect the motivation of employees. If our employees are supposed to be happy and friendly and care for customers, then they need to be well motivated for that. After the strike, if they haven't got what they want, they may be unmotivated. And that, of course, will lead to less quality performance. Also, it may lead to bad publicity. Strikes often make the new news and quite often the, the working man, the average working man who watches the news sides with the strikers. They do not side with the, the multi-millionaire owners. They work for, or they side with the common working man who they are themselves. So it can have a huge impact on the company, huge impact on the brand because people look at it and think, oh, why Shrewsbury Hotels? Are they were the people that were striking, uh, that, that fired all their employees simply because they asked for a, a small cost of living raise? So oh, they're horrible. We don't want to work with them. We don't want to go and spend our money in their hotels. And of course, generally a strike is not in the best interest of the business as a whole. So there is a reason not to have a strike. But of course, you shouldn't give in easily either because sometimes change is simply necessary. If we have staff in a hotel that we purchase as a going concern who have had a way of doing things for the last 20 years and it's no way in the Wise Choice Hotel's way of doing things, they're not particularly great with the customers and so it's going to affect repeat business and people would expect more from a Wise Choice Hotel, then we have to change. We have to either force them to change or replace them. And of course, the obvious thing that in a strike, the company is losing money. And if you're striking because you're not being paid enough and the company can't pay you more because it's already approaching a loss making step, you simply cannot keep giving in and giving more and more because ultimately the company itself is going to start making a loss and then everyone will lose their job. So it's often worth making a point to unions if they're considering striking that if you strike, the company will go under and you'll lose your jobs anyway. Now, SEMA and the examiner will ultimately expect you to make a fair point for all. So do not just automatically side with the company, side with the directors because you're working as part of the finance department. You must consider everyone. You must consider the issue from all angles. And so various models you can use here, the Lewin's unfreeze, move and refreeze model is a key way for you to adequately handle a change. So you bring in all stakeholders and work to find a suitable conclusion for everyone and you ensure that changes are solidified. 
And therefore, once people have got used to the way of doing things, once they're bought into it, then you should be left in a position where everyone is happy. You can also talk about the Mendelo's matrix. Obviously, the owners, the staff, the customers are all key stakeholders of the business. And therefore, we have to manage a suitable conclusion. We cannot just side purely with the owners and directors. We cannot side purely with the workers. We must come to an appropriate conclusion. And finally, motivation theories such as Maslow's and Hertzberg's. These are important because these are other ways in which we can motivate staff other than money. So we do not necessarily have to worry about paying them more. We can perhaps keep them satisfied by giving them more responsibility, giving them more of uh, achievements or congratulating on their achievements, recognizing what they do for the company, why they are so important to the company. And that in turn can keep employees satisfied even if they are not being paid any more because of it. So I hope you've enjoyed this sample video and more importantly found it useful. Before I go, I'd like to quickly tell you about a few of the products that we do here at Astranti Financial Training, specifically for our case study courses. We have a study text which details all the key theories in which you will be expected to use in your case study exam, as well as details of how to approach the pre-scene and the case study. We also have a series of course videos detailing how to answer case study questions. This is actually an area in which many students struggle. Most of the scripts that I've seen, the failing scripts that I've seen, has actually been due to poor case study technique rather than lack of knowledge. We also have a series of pre-scene analysis videos based on the current up-to-date pre-scene detailing all the key bits of information and likely issues you may face in the exam. Next up is the industry analysis, a pack detailing information about the industry that the precinct company resides in, information about the key players within that industry and more background information on the industry in general. We also have a range of mock exams created for each level and based on the current precinct which is a great way to get some practice in before you sit the real thing. We also offer marking and feedback on those mock exams so you can see where you are going wrong and where you can improve. Finally, we have the master classes. These are two one day classes taken by our expert tutors to give you all the, the hints and tips you need to really add to your chances of passing the exam. Also, if you take our full course, we offer a pass guarantee, which provided you have met all the requirements of the pass guarantee, you will get a free reset on the next exam should you fail to pass. So once again, thank you for your time. If you're interested in any of these products, please visit the website www.astranti.com for more information. Thank you.